The story of the rich man and Lazarus is used by the church to support the doctrine of hell. The rich man and Lazarus is perhaps the church's champion passage to support this teaching. The rich man and Lazarus is used as the definitive story to show that good folks go to heaven and predators go to hell. <laughs> now, that sinners go to hell. Well, predators, sinners, I said. Well, I totally disagree with this understanding of the story. And whether or not there is a hell, I think that the story of the rich man and Lazarus has nothing at all to do with that subject or with what happens to you and me when we die. I believe that the rich man and Lazarus is a parable, an eschatological parable, a parable about the end of the world, to use the King James words, or the end of the age. I believe it's a parable about the last days. I believe it's a parable about the event, events that took place in the first century. And even more specifically tonight, I believe that the rich man and Lazarus is a parable about the changing of the priesthood in the last day. And I hope and pray that by the end of my lesson you will see this too. So fasten your seatbelts and let's get going. Speaking of fastening your seatbelts reminds me of a true story that is told on the great fight of Muhammad Ali. Most of us are old enough that we remember Ali when he was in his prime. Uh, the story says that he was on an airplane taking a trip and the, the mic Microphone and the pilot's uh, compartment came on and the speakers came on and, and the pilot said, ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot. Uh, we are entering some turbulence, so fasten your seatbelts, please. Everyone be seated quickly and fasten your seatbelts. Well, that's everyday jargon for pilots, but for some of us it kind of brings on cardiac arrest, I guess. But anyway, the... Stewardess was walking up and down the aisle to make sure that everybody had their seat belts fastened and she came to Ali and his was not buckled and she said, Mr. Ali, please fasten your seat belts. Those of us who remember Ali remember that he never was known for his humility. And he replied to the stewardess, Superman don't need no seat belts. <laughs> the sharp stewardess came right back and said, Pardon my English, but Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> so fasten your seatbelts. There might be a little bit of turbulence here. I visited a friend and a brother in the hospital last month. He'd been airlifted by a helicopter from our city, Rocky Mount, to another city that had more advanced medical facilities. But when I visited him, his sense of humor was still okay. And he told me, he said, I told that helicopter pilot that flying is against my religion. I kind of waited, and he kind of waited. And so I chuckled and took the bait and said, why? He said, well, I told him that I like to live near Jesus. And Jesus promised in his word, lo, I am with you always. <laughs> well, that's enough aeronautical stories, I guess. <laughs> I just hope being on the second floor is low enough for Jesus to be with us. My subject today is not the church's doctrine of hell, the doctrine that all men who die without Christ, who die without faith in Jesus, who die in their sins immediately go to a place of conscious eternal torture where they will be burned in little fire for eternity writhing in agony and torment for their sins with never any hope of just burning up or any hope of escaping their fate, doomed forever and ever to just burn and scream and burn and scream again. But thank my Lord, hell is not my subject. However, since the rich man and Lazarus is the preeminent passage that the church uses to support its teaching of hell, I feel like perhaps I'd owe you a little upfront information with regards to how I feel about the matter of hell. So fasten your seat belts and remember my sermon, loving one another in the kingdom. 
I do not believe in the church's doctrine of hell. Again, here is where I beg you to apply loving one another in the kingdom. Now, I realize in our congregation, some of us do believe in hell, and some of you may have immediately been disappointed in me and lost a little respect for me. I hope not. On the other hand, some of us do not believe in hell, and you're excited to hear that somebody else feels the same way. And then some of us are not sure about this doctrine of hell and would really like to understand it better. But again, hell is not my subject. But since most Christians think the rich man and Lazarus is about hell, I felt I should make that known as my position before I get started. Let's move on to the rich man and Lazarus. As I said earlier, I believe this story is another of Jesus' parables. And like most of his parables, it is a parable about events in the first century. It's a parable about the end of the world or the end of the age. It's a parable set in the last days. It's a parable about the people living then. Now the church, of course, says this is not a parable. That it is a true story about a little rich man and a little poor beggar and a pack of stray hounds running around Jerusalem. I doubt this. And my dear brother and fellow preterist, Sam Dawson, in whom comparison I am as nothing, in his book, Essays on Eschatology, Brother Sam concludes that the rich man in Lazarus is a legend. I respectfully doubt that too, but when we have finished, you decide. You be the judge. The church, however, in saying that the rich man in Lazarus is a true story, ignores completely the fact that Jesus didn't go around teaching by telling true stories. In fact, he did the exact opposite. He told parables. And it was so much his way and method that Matthew 13, 34 tells us all these things Jesus spake unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Well, based on that verse alone, we could have a hard time proving that this story is not a parable. <clears throat> Consider the context and the setting of this story, which is in Luke, the 16th chapter. It begins in chapter 14 with Jesus on the Sabbath day healing a man with a dropsy and, of course, being watched and being accused. And Jesus begins, begins there in that 14th chapter by telling a series of his most famous parables in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of Luke. Among other parables that are included in Luke 14 is the parable of the Great Supper, and the parable of the king going to war. In Luke 15 is the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. In Luke 16 is the parable of the unjust steward, followed by the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And yes, friends, this is a parable too. And to call it a true story is to take it completely out of the context there with all the other parables. Plus, the church says that because the story is about a certain rich man, that it's got to be a true story and not a parable. Well, the very 16th chapter of Luke, where the, this story is, starts off with another parable, the parable of the unjust steward, and it starts off by saying there was a certain rich man. And nobody ever argues that because that was a certain rich man, the parable of the unjust steward is a true story too, and not a parable. A parable is a figurative illustration of some fact or truth. You know that. The truth is generally not on the surface of a parable, but hidden down beneath the figures there. This doesn't mean, I don't think, that every single word or phrase in a, in a parable is, has some hidden meaning. But generally, the main characters that are introduced are not the real ones that the speaker has in mind. Therefore, the parables always demand thought, and study. So let us begin our study. And the first three verses of the parable in Luke 16, 19, 20, and 21, and I'm reading from the old King James. It's not because, Jeff, I think that that's the only version, but been with me since I was a boy, and what little verses I know, 
that's how it's said. And uh, I go reading something else, and then, then I kind of quote it, and I get mixed up. But I look at all kind of versions. But there was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Can we identify this rich man? We have some descriptions that will help us when we get to that point. His clothing, purple and fine linen, his economic condition, he fared well. His character is not attacked. It does not say he was a sinner or that he was an evil, wicked person. He was just living well and dressing nicely. His one flaw seemed to be a lack of compassion for a beggar that laid at his gate continually. And we don't know, but if indeed, like the church says, this is a true story, then the rich man may have helped the beggar for years and was feeling like it's about time for the beggar to help himself a little bit, if it's a true story. What we do know is that later on, Abraham told the rich man that in his lifetime, he, the rich man, had had good things. And for all of this, preachers all across America tell us that this rich man was sent to hell. Sent to hell 2,000 years ago, mind you, where he's been burning and writhing and screaming ever since. But that 2,000 years is nothing because he's got to be there burning for eternity. Now tell me this, other than the story we're dealing with, where in the Bible does living well, dressing nicely, having good things, but somehow not having quite as much compassion as you should have on beggars, where do those things get you sent to eternal hellfire? Where? In all the scriptures about what you must do to be saved, where, where does this show this man's lacking? If this is the criteria, I mean, living well, dressing nice, and having good things, maybe not being quite as compassionate as we should for the poor, if this is the criteria, we all better get nervous. But we've had our good things, most of us. We, we've had our good things. And perhaps none of us have been as mindful to help the poor as we should have. And the other main character, our beggar, he was poor and hungry and sickly, and Abraham, Abraham said later that in his lifetime our beggar had had bad things, had a hard time. And who knows again, if it's a true story, like the church says, the beggar may have ended up begging because he'd always lived a slowful kind of life and been irresponsible, if it was a true story. What we do know is he was poor, he was sickly, he was hungry, and he'd had a hard life. And for all of this, the theologians tell us he was sent to heaven. Here again, tell me where in the Bible, being poor and sickly and hungry and having a rough time in life qualifies you to go to heaven. Where? Where? What must I do to be saved? Where are these things listed? It's easy to see that the church's interpretation of this story is very shallow and so much without scriptural support. Back to our rich man. Can we identify who he was? You don't have to take a lot of notes. There are a lot of notes to be taken. And because of that, I uh, have prepared them for you. I started off to make an outline. And I want to be two pages to keep down the cost. I do the front and the back. But my outline became an essay, and so it got to be three pages. <laughs> so then I went on and made a fourth page, and did write a little essay. But anyway, I printed a, a whole pile of these, and there's enough for all of you to have one or more, as you feel the need of, and I have a few more over there at the, at the table afterwards. You still may want to take some notes, but anyway, what? I got it, thank you. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to pass them out. I'm going to let people come up and get them. Thank you, J.J. He's the nicest young man. We came walking in yesterday. It was the first time I see him, and he was standing there with his hand. 
to shake my hand before I reached out my fine young man, April's boy. <clears throat> Somebody here near the front said, uh, is, is an amen okay? I think it'd be wonderful. <laughs> Considering my subject and my position, you might not get, might not get any, but <laughs> I was telling him, I, I told my, I've told my wife before, if I could preach in a black church, I could, I could get on fire. Cause those folks just, they just pump you and keep you going. <laughs> I hope you find some agreement with what we say. And if you want to say hallelujah, praise the Lord. Or if you can't keep your seat, stand up, it's all right. Can we identify the rich man? I present for your consideration this afternoon that the certain rich man represents the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood established by God through Moses for his people, beginning in the wilderness with Aaron of the tribe of Levi. The description in verse 9 helps us identify him. One thing, he was dressed in purple and fine linen. Now, I've got oodles of scriptures to read, but I'm going to skip a lot of them and just get a few here and there. But in Exodus, the 28th chapter, verse 2, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Exodus 28 and 5, And thou shalt take gold and blue and purple, another rich man, and scarlet and fine linen, another rich man. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen. Thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen. And thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. 39 and 2 in Exodus. And he made the ephod of gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, fine twined linen. 39 and 3, and they did beat the gold into the thin plates and cut it into wires to work it in the blue and in the purple and in the scarlet and in the fine linen with cunning work. Well, this fits. Friends, here's our certain rich man, the Levitical priesthood, clothed in his purple and fine linen. And there's another identifying characteristic. He was faring sumptuously every day. In what dimension this afternoon should we consider the riches of the Levitical priesthood? Well, think of it naturally, the natural riches. The priests fared well because they lived off the tithes of all the rest of Israel. In Numbers 18 and 24, the scripture says, But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer and heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. 18 and 21, And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance. And people, those tithes were immense, simply immense, consisting of the first and the best of all that Israel had. And they made this favored tribe be able to fare sumptuously every day. But consider the spiritual riches of the Levites. They alone could minister among the holy things. They, they alone could enter the holy places. They alone could read and expound the law. They alone could officiate as ministers and mediators at the golden altars. This was riches. This was sumptuous fare of the highest sense. But there's more. Numbers 18 and 20 says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in the land. All this trouble Aaron was going to. He said, Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land. Neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thine inheritance among the children of Israel. Wow. Can you imagine riches greater than this? Wealth beyond measuring. Which you rather have, Brother Jim? 25 acres in Canaan or the Lord God Almighty? Wow. I think we've identified our rich man. I suspect the religious leaders begin to realize that he was talking about them, as was the case in Matthew 24 and 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. And we should not overlook here, in talking about the rich man's riches, a few things that were perhaps not very desirable but riches to him and enjoyable to his flesh. In the days of Christ, the priesthood was rich with power, pomp, pride, tradition, 
arrogance and self-righteousness. Verse 20 said, the rich man had a gate. The rich man had a gate. And most often in the Bible, a gate referred to the gate in the walls of the city. And in the lives of Israelites, the gate was a very important place. It played a highly important role. The gate were places of business. The gates were places where legal agreements were executed. Remember Boaz going down to the gates to try to get the permission and the, and the right to marry Ruth? But of great importance, and in our story of the greatest importance, the gates were the places of judgment and justice among the people. It was the courthouse, if you will, where people sought justice. And I do not have to dwell on this point. You are students of the Bible, you know that. But in Deuteronomy 16 and 18, judges and officers, officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates. Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Lots of passages. A lot I'm going to list on this paper there. In the days of Amos, justice has kind of been forgotten. Amos says, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. They turn aside the poor in the gate from their rights. And later Amos says, Hate the evil, love the good, establish judgment in the gates. So this rich man's gate represents the Hebrew Jewish seat of judgment. It's a place where justice was available for all or should have been available for all. The rich man's gate. Verse 21, the rich man had a table. What is the purpose of a table? Well, in this story, the table was a place to eat. The rich man fared sumptuously at that table. This table sustained life for him. It fed him and it fed others. What table did Levi have? What table did the Levitical priesthood have that sustained them and fed them and kept them in power and faring sumptuously every day? You know, but in Exodus 34, 27, and 28, the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and he didn't either eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The table of the law and the prophets was the rich man's table. The law of Moses established his order, the law of Moses legitimized his order, it sustained his life, and it sustained the spiritual life of Israel. His table, which commanded that he receive the tithes of Israel, kept him fair and sumptuously every day. But verse 21 said, crumbs fell from that table. Crumbs fell from the rich man's table. I will talk more about these crumbs later. Well, now let me say that these crumbs represent things about the law and the prophet. That the Levitical priesthood, our rich man, should have been careful to serve to Israel, to eat himself, but he let them fall from his table like crumbs to the floor, unheeded and unimportant to him. Let us summarize. For your consideration, we have presented the rich man as the Levitical priesthood clothed in purple and fine linen, faring sumptuously every day from the towers of Israel. The rich man had a gate representing the place of justice and judgment in the life of the Levitical priesthood and in the lives of all the Israelites. The rich man had a table, the law and the prophets, which fed him and sustained his life. And he let some important things from that law and prophets, just crumbs to him, fall from his table. Unused, unwanted, unheeded. Let's move to our beggar. 
Can we identify him? We have some things to help us again. Number one, he was poor. He was a beggar, so he was poor. Number two, his name was Lazarus. Number three, he laid at the rich man's gate. Number four, he was full of sores. Number five, he was hungry and just wanted the crumbs that fell off the rich man's table. And number six, dogs came and licked his sores. Who does this beggar represent? Can we find anyone that this symbolic language would present as a beggar and at the same time identify him as laying at the rich man's gate wanting justice? These six points describing our beggar are a perfect description of our Lord Jesus. So we offer for your consideration that the beggar in this story is a figure of Jesus. Look at the beggar's name, Lazarus, of Hebrew origin, Eleazar, meaning God is helper, or help of God. Well, that fits Jesus all right, doesn't he? Jesus is surely the help of God for mankind, isn't he? He's our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. Lazarus fits him. Was Jesus poor like a beggar? Well, immediately you know, Matthew 8 and 20 says, And Jesus said, And him the foxes have hold, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. But being poor in a physical, natural sense, I think, is not perhaps the better sense of the poverty of our beggar in this parable. I think that the better sense of this poverty is that it is a figure of the wonderful humility of the Son of God. Poor in spirit, humble, meek. The Scripture says it all in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for a sore sakes he became poor, that through his poverty ye might be rich. Or Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. After that he poureth, in John 13 and 5, water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was dirty. Is Jesus poor, humble? Philips, Philippians 2, 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So whether naturally that Jesus had not where to lay his head, or in spirit and attitude, Jesus hits the role of being poor, but did Jesus ever beg like a beggar? Wow, did he ever beg, Brother Drew? For three and a half years, he poured his heart out to his people, begging them to receive him, begging them to accept him. But like Paul said in Romans 10, when he quoted Isaiah, all the day long have I stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and a gangsaying people. I wonder how many times it's recorded for us just once, but I wonder how many times Jesus said, Come unto me. I wonder how many times he begged them like that. Finally, you know, when he was given up, Matthew 23 and 37, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And you would not. Was Jesus a beggar? Did he ever beg? In this parable, Jesus was pictured himself as a beggar in comparison to the well-to-do, proud, self-righteous Jewish religious leader. That beggar was covered with sores. Was Jesus full of sores? Uh, was he wounded? Zechariah's famous prophecy immediately comes to mind when he says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And he shall answer and say, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And while we can certainly include Jesus' physical, natural, bodily suffering, if we like, I think these sores 
have more to do with the grief he suffered emotionally, spiritually, and mentally from being rejected by his own people. Can you imagine that Jesus for this was full of sores? Sores of grief and agony and hurt, the pain of rejection. John 1.11, he came into his own, and his own received him not. The scriptures had predicted it, of course. Multitudes of them, Isaiah 53 and 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Did that bring sores to your heart? Hebrews 2 and 10 says, For it became him for whom all things and by whom all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through suffering. Sores. Luke 19, 41 when he was coming here, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. The sores were hurting. Matthew 13 and 55, the people looked at him with scorn and mockery and said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And they were all offended in him. Sores. And the Pharisees also were very covetous. They heard all these things, and they derided him. John 10, 20, and many of them said, He hath a devil. He's mad. Why hear ye him? Was Jesus covered with sores? Brother Bob, sores of rejection and sores of mockery and sores of unbelief. This parable is beautiful beyond description. This evening, where did Jesus suffer? Sister Sandy, Jesus laid, him, laid himself at the rich man's gate. The gate being the place where justice could be found, but not for Jesus. Jesus, as it were, laid himself at the feet of the Jewish religious leaders, wanting recognition, wanting acceptance, wanting justice as Israel's Messiah. But he found none. Acts 8.32 says the place of the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. Acts 8.33 says in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. That's what happened to our beggar. That's what happened to Jesus laying at the feet of his priesthood that he had ordained and instituted and set up, wanting justice. But his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? Hebrews 13 and 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That's a reference to the fact, of course, that Jesus was literally physically crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem, outside the city gates. And there's lots of significance there. But for our parable, he was crucified outside the place of justice where he should have gotten a fair trial. They bypassed it. They didn't bypass it physically. They literally marched Jesus and his cross right through the courtyard of their courthouse right through the gate and right out to Golgotha's hill. And outside the justice that was supposed to be available for all of the rich man's gate, Jesus suffered without that gate. In his humility, he labored to win his people. Brother Jerry, he preached to them. He turned their water to wine. He'd heal their sick. He'd raise their dead. And he laid himself at the rich man's gate, but he found no justice. The crumbs, the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, what were they? I believe tonight they were the unheeded types and shadows of the law, the unheeded prophecies of Israel's prophets that 
positively identified Jesus the Christ as their Messiah. But like crumbs brushed from his table, the rich man let these prophecies, these messianic prophecies, fall from his table. Unimportant, unnecessary, like crumbs. And they went unheeded and brushed away. Scriptures like Genesis 49 and 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. Well, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. The Levites paid no attention like crumbs rushed from the table. Micah said in 5 and 2, But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be among the thousands of Judah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me he that is to be ruler in Israel. Wow. Well, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Two and two together here. Another fact. But it was another crumb. It's another crumb. The rich man brushed from his table. Unheeded. And on and on and on it goes. Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, well, Mary said she was a virgin. But you know what kind of reception she got from that, I'm sure? Laugh that's gone. Another crumb. Had they paid attention to them, heeded them. They could have seen, this is our Messiah. We're waiting for him. Here he is. Zechariah 9, 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout, O daughter Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation and lowly. Riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foal of an ass. Wow. Jesus did that. And how about this for identifying the Messiah? The blind were seeing. The lame were walking. The dead were being raised to life. And the gospel was being preached to the poor. But that proud, pompous Levitical priest stood, brushed all that aside, and let it fall from the table like crumbs. Back to our beggar. The beggar was wanting those crumbs, Brother Mark. He was wanting those crumbs. Yes, yes I got the crumbs. These crumbs, I've just read a few of them to you. Oh, they'd have fed Jesus' hunger for acceptance. They'd have fed that agony in his, in his gut to be accepted. They'd have recognized, oh, he's born of the tribe of Judah, and that's what the Scripture says. He came out of Bethlehem, and that's what it says. It said he'd be born of a virgin, and Mary says she was. We can't prove it, but the Scripture said it would happen like that. Jesus, our beggar, just wanted I could just have these crumbs. Ah. Feed, it feed the inner desires to be identified and accepted as their Messiah. What right did Jesus have to think that Levitical priesthood and Judah ought to believe on him? Well, Paul said in Romans, what advantage hath the Jew? He says, much every way, chiefly that it because unto them were committed the oracles of God. The rich man had his table. Brother Don. Galatians 3.24 says it was a schoolmaster to lead him to Christ. But because of the rich man's neglect, then his crumbs fall to the floor. Paul said in Romans 11.9 that their table, as our same word here, their table became a snare and a trap and a stumbling block instead of leading them to Christ. These little minute details of the law and the prophets that would have positively identified Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah of Israel, like crumbs they let fall from the table. What did Jesus identify as one of the major sins of the day? 
Matthew 23 and 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of a net, a mint, a nice and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone. The priesthood got, the priesthood got those tithes, but they let fall so many crumbs, so many prophecies that would have been positively identified Jesus. There's more. Jesus drew us a picture here. There's more. Dogs came by the beggar and licked his store. If this is a true literal story, I suppose, again, there were a pack of hounds running around Jerusalem and came by and licked the sword. Soothing, helping. When I was a boy, people used to say, let the dog lick, let the dog lick that moon, it'll get well quicker. People, from the point of view of the rich man and the Jews, ask this question, who were these dogs? You know the answer. They were the Samaritans and other Gentile people with whom the Jews would have nothing to do because in the eyes of the Jews, all the Gentiles were just dogs. A classic example in Jesus' own words is in Matthew 15, beginning at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed unto the coast of Tyria and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And the disciples came and besought him, and saying, Send her away, for she's crying after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came, worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Then Jesus said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. I always hated so much that Jesus was so harsh on her, brother guy. Oh, my loving Jesus, and he'd say such a thing to a lady. It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Dr. Adam Clark, commenting on this passage, says, Dogs, such the Gentiles were reputed by the Jewish people, and our Lord uses that form of speech which was common among his countrymen. How did the Gentiles lick his sores? How did they soothe Jesus' hurts? Your head, I mean, you know, by their expressions of faith in him and belief in him. Go back to this woman whom Jesus just likened to a dog. And even after having been put down so low by this man in whom she believed, she responded and said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. In verse 22 of what we've read just now, this Gentile dog called Jesus, O Lord, thou son of David. In verse 25, she worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. Now in verse Jesus 28, Jesus says, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as you want. How did the law dogs lick the beggar's sores? How did the Gentiles soothe the aching heart of our Lord Jesus? By believing in him. Showing faith. Consider the story of the Roman centurion. You know it well. Jesus, Jesus had been sent for to come and heal the Roman centurion's servant. In Luke 7, then Jesus went with them. And when it was not very far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter into my roof, under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come to thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. 
This centurion said, I didn't feel worthy to go to you. He sent some other folks. And now he's coming to his house and said, I don't feel worthy for you to come to my house. He said, just say the word. For I also am a man set under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goeth. To another, come, and he cometh. To my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things. He marveled at him. And he turned about and said to the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Wow. Wow. They that were sent, returning the house, found the servant whole that was sick. Here is a great example of the dogs licking our beggar's sores. Of the Gentiles' faith in Jesus, soothing the rejection of his people. My brothers and sisters, this is so beautiful. Is this picture Jesus drawing coming into focus for you? I hope so. This certain beggar, Lazarus, the help of God. Is Jesus describing himself? Poor and despised, hungry for acceptance, hurting from rejection. While our Israel's religious leaders, our rich man, fared sumptuously every day. Jesus came into his own and laid at the gate of his people, looking for justice and mercy and faith, and found only the source of agony, of rejection and crucifixion. Hungry for acceptance, but not finding it because of the prophecies that would have identified him as Israel's Messiah, like crumbs that fall into the floor unheeded by the Levitical priesthood. But the Gentiles soothed his wounds, those he received in the house of his friends. The dogs of Jerusalem, just Thea, eased his pain by their expressions here and there of faith in him. People, this certain beggar is the same person in the parable of the Good Samaritan that was called the certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and they stripped him and they wounded him and they left him half dead. It was Jesus who threw himself in the path of the priest and the priest, when he came by, Sister Brenda saw him and passed on the other side. It was Jesus, in the words of our parable, who laid at the rich man's gate, and the Levi came and looked on him. He passed on by. And you know the story. It was a dog. One of those dogs, a Samaritan, who had compassion on him. Took him up, poured oil in his wounds. Took care of him. You know the story. The dogs lick the beggar's sores. I pray this picture is getting clear for you and coming into focus. We knew to another aspect of this thing. Verse 22, the beggar died. And the rich man died too. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. The beggar was carried into Abraham's bosom. Now the church that says this is a real true story, this is a little story, needs no interpretation. At this point, they tell us that Abraham's bosom is typical of heaven and that the beggar went to heaven. Hold on a minute. If this is a little true story, and not a parable, then Abraham's bosom doesn't need any interpretation. It's Abraham's bosom. You've got to take it literally just like it says. But then you say, that's not impossible. How can a beggar get inside another man's bosom, especially another man that's been dead for centuries? But if Abraham, but if the rich man is some natural rich man, and if Lazarus is some natural beggar, and the dogs are a pack of hounds running around town, then Abraham's bosom has got to be Abraham's bosom too. Can't we see people that it's a parable, that it's figurative language, that, that it's symbolics, it's signs and symbols? And if you cannot take Abraham's bosom literally, and it actually means something else like heaven or whatever, 
then we admit that this story is a parable and it does need some interpretation and you can't just take it literally. And as Abraham's bosom is figured as something else, then the rich man is figurative, then the beggars are symbol, and the dogs and the deaths and the flames are all figurative too. Back to our parable, the beggar died. Who is our beggar? Jesus. I see the death of our beggar in this picture as the end of of Jesus' earthly ministry. The beggar died. He wasn't buried. He went to Abraham's bosom. Where did Jesus go when he left the earth? Well, he said once in John 16 and 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. John 7 and 33, then Jesus said unto him, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. I believe this afternoon that Abraham here in our parable is a type of God in his role as father. That's not a stretch in biblical studies to take that position. That Abraham is representing God. Abraham was, after all, the father of the faithful. Abraham was the father of the Hebrew nation. And Abraham, you remember, like God, had to become willing to offer his only begotten son as a sacrifice. So it's very fitting that Abraham be a symbol of God. In this passage we've just read, Jesus said, I go to my Father. I go unto him that sent me. Jesus went back to the Father. John 13 and 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. And I think being in the bosom of Abraham is a picture of the close relationship between Father and Son. And I think the bosom represents a place of comfort and safety and peace and quiet for Jesus in stark contrast to what the rich man was having to endure. John 14 and 20, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me and I in you. Let's settle this in our minds forever. This is absolutely beautiful. John 1, 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? We'll come back to our beggar. The rich man died too. And as was the case with the beggar's death, so always with the rich man, I believe it represents, again, the rich man, the Levitical priesthood established by Moses, and what happened to that priesthood in the last days? It ended. In the figurative language of our parable, the rich man died. He ended his earthly ministry and he didn't have any other. And that was it. He was buried. The rich man died and they buried him. Indicating the final and complete end of the Levitical order. The purpose of the law and its priesthood was over and finished. Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law had served its purpose and it ended. For Christ, Paul says in Romans, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And in Luke 16.16, 16, The law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of heaven is preached, and every man presseth into it. The rich man's table, the law that had established him and sustained him, it was now gone, or at least in this transition period, passing away. And with it, the rich man was finished too. The Levitical order established by the table of the law passed too. His time has come, his priesthood was ending, and his death and his burial, like the end of the law, again was a process ongoing during the transition. All of you know Hebrews 8, 13 by heart. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And finally it did when judgment came. And here is the climax of my sermon this morning, this evening. While one priesthood was ending, Brother Gary, what priesthood 
was beginning. You know, the Messianic priesthood of Christ was beginning. Unlike the rich man, the beggar was not buried. He went to Abraham's bosom. Indicating that while Jesus' earthly ministry ended, his work in heaven was continuing, brother Ron. Hallelujah. What was his earthly work? Well, on the earth, he became the sacrifice that fulfilled all the sacrifices. He became the one that counted for our sins. But now he's gone back to his Father to continue his work. What did Jesus return to the Father to do? Glory. To begin his work as our great high priest. Hallelujah. To offer his own blood in the heaven and tabernacle. To offer atonement for our sin. The rich man in Lazarus this morning, people, is a parable about the changing of the priesthood in the last days. Glory to the Lord. In Hebrews 4 and 14, the writer says, See and then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews 9 and 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands which are figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Oh, this is beautiful beyond description. Beautiful beyond description. The whole chapter, ninth chapter of Hebrews, is, is just marvelous about all this. 9-11 says, But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. That scripture is a 2,000-year-old scripture. And it don't just say, as the King James has here, that you become a, a high priest of good things to come. It was the good things of about to come. Mellow is there. And that was about to come 2,000 years ago. Neither by blood in verse 12 of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place. This is the heavenly, heavenly holy place. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered through the holy place every year with the blood of others. For well, then he must often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, in the end of the world, or the end of the age, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look at him the second time shall he appear without sin unto salvation. He went into the heaven of tabernacle to offer his own blood in atonement for our sins. And down below, the persecuted, suffering church waited. Waited to see if their high priest, their new high priest, that had taken over from the ones they'd known all their lives, if he would come out of the holy place, his blood accepted for their sins. They waited, they waited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They waited. Brother Steve, if he hasn't come out yet, they're still waiting. And if he hasn't come out yet, they're still in their sins. And I'm still in my sins. If he's still there waiting to see his father accept his blood. But the scripture we just said, it was, he was the high priest of good things about to come. Hallelujah. And we know he came out. He did come back in the end of that, in the end of that period of time. By about 70 AD, somewhere in that time frame, the Lord came back in his judgment to the wicked and with his reward to the righteous. Christians believe, refuse to believe that he came. They say, they tell me, nobody saw him. Nobody saw him. I don't know what that means. Nobody saw him. Are you telling me to quit in five minutes? I can't. Nobody saw him. They say, where is he recorded? Show me a record, one man's word, where, where somebody saw Jesus come back. And I say to them, and I say to you, old Christian, can't you believe that Jesus came back while some of his first followers were alive because he promised them he would? Oh, such great Christians we have. We've claimed to believe in Jesus. But we can't believe 
that he came back when he said he was coming. He told his preachers, you go preach, boys, but when I come back, you're going to still be fleeing from city to city. Yes, yeah, keep that in mind. Why come people can't believe that Jesus did just what he promised? Where is our faith in Jesus? When Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Why come Christians who profess so much faith in Jesus cannot believe in their own Jesus? I told you earlier, this was a parable about the end of the age, about the last days of the old priesthood and the first days of the new, events of the first century. The next verses, 23, 4, and 5, we would read, <clears throat> And in hell he lift up his eyes, Luke, Luke 16 and 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, this is the rich man, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. A note here. You notice that the rich man called Abraham father. And Abraham called the rich man son. What people called Abraham father, folks? It was the Hebrews. It was the Israelites, the Jews. This parable is all about them. Abraham was the rich man's father. Abraham was the great tribal leader and father of Levi. At this point in the church's version of this true story, the rich man is screaming and crying for help, and there's no help that can be gotten to him. If you'll be honest with yourselves, in, all the, in the multitude of sermons that we've heard, and I guess you have too, this is a picture again of heaven and hell. And if you be honest with yourself, in heaven, you hear your loved ones screaming and wanting help. You can't get to them. If this is a true story and this is a picture of our being in heaven, who wants to go? It seems that we can hear our friends and our loved ones who didn't believe in Christ, screaming in agony and begging for help, and we can't get to them. This seems to be the case if you're going to take the story literally. Can we not see again now that the story of the rich man and Lazarus is indeed a parable of Jesus, and that Christ, as he always did, is using signs and symbols and figurative language to teach the people. In fact, as we quoted for you already, Matthew said he never spake to them without a parable. So what do these verses mean? We preterists understand so well what was going on in this period of transition that this should be easier for us to grasp, perhaps, than for other congregations. How did the Levitical priesthood go down? We said he was a rich man, and then he died, and that was represented by the ending of his day. His fair and sumptuously was coming to its end. All the pomp and circumstance that he had known was about to be over. What kind of attitude did the priesthood have about all this? About being told that their day was over, that their dispensation was ended, that their, law, longer, that their law was no longer of any value for righteousness. Well, verse 23 tells us, and in hell he dipped up his eyes being in torment. That's how he felt about it. First of all, I have to deal briefly with the word hell. Again, hell's not my subject, and I'm glad. But the word hell should not be here. It's an awful translation of the word Hades by the King James translators. This fact is proved in the fact that many of the newer translations correct this error. Many of them, for example, the New King James and the New American Standard Bible, they just don't translate it all. They just leave it Hades. And so it reads, in Hades he lift up his eyes, being in torment. But Hades was one of the Greek words used for the grave, the place of the dead. 
And if it was translated, it ought to be, in my opinion, translated the grave. Then in his grave he lift up his eyes, being in torment. But how did we do with the word Hades? Nothing in the definition of Hades that I've been able to determine defines it as a place where wicked people are tortured for the seats of the ages of eternity. Nothing in the definition of Hades is found that says that, as far as I know. In fact, I would venture to say that the Greek language of Christ's day did not have a word that meant, meant what our English word hell means today. I mean, if you want to use a word here that meant he was in a place where he was going to be forever and ever burning and burning, I don't think had a word that, that, that meant that. I may be wrong. But our rich man in his grave lifts up his eyes. It's not a literal physical grave. When did you ever know of a physical per dead person in a physical grave lifting up their eyes and talking? Again, this is parabolic, figurative language. What we have is the rich man in his transition period of dying and going out of business. In this condition, he is in torment. Uh, it is not a man in his grave talking. Ecclesiastes 9 and 5 said, The dead know not anything. In 9 and 10 it says, Whatsoever thy hand find to do, do with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whether thou goest. Naturally dead people don't open their eyes and carry on conversation, but our rich man was in torment. I asked you earlier, what were the feelings of the priest about the ending of their age, about their world ending, about their time of faring sumptuously coming to a close? Verse 23 tells us they were in torment. They were in untold agony and misery. They were angry and fighting mad, willing to kill anybody, even the Son of God, in order to keep their place. They were tormented by this very idea. In no way did the Levitical priesthood respond to the coming of Christ like John the Baptist did. You remember John the Baptist? With the arrival of Christ, John bowed out graciously. He said, Christ must increase, I must decrease. But not so with the religious leaders among the Jews. They could not take it. They could not accept that their end had come. They resisted. They fought against it. They were tormented, if you will, in these flames. And these flames, I think, are used here in the parable, not in a literal sense of fire, but in a figurative sense. And they may, the Lord may have used flames to, to indicate how bad their torment was. Is there any pain to us humans as bad as a pain of a burn? It is awful. And this is the kind of a condition they were in, in their anger and in their rage about their day ending. If the place where the beggar went, Abraham's bosom, is figurative and not legal, then the place where the rich man went and the flames that tormented him, they were not little physical flames. They were figurative in nature. To put it mildly, Jesus had indeed built a fire under the religious leaders. Can you agree with that? That he had built a fire under the religious leaders. He even said, I am come to send fire on the earth in Luke 12. And what will I if it already be kindled? Well, Jesus wasn't going around Jerusalem and Judea gathering up sticks and stuff and starting bonfires. It wasn't a natural fire that Jesus had come to, to create among people. But the, and the, the fire that he did come to create was a fire of the passion of hatred and jealousy and envy and everything else that filled these guys' hearts now as they were being told, your day is over. And the rich man was tormented in these flames. Nothing tormented the Jewish religious leaders as much as the success of the resurrection. They were on fire with rage and anger. In Acts 5 and 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Earlier in the Gospels, in Matthew, then the Pharisees went out, held a council against him, how they might destroy him. Do you see any rage? Do you see any burning passion here? Do you see any torment in their souls about what was happening in that first century? And Luke says, and they were filled with madness and communed with one another what they might do to Jesus. 
Again, do you see any fires of hatred and passion in these verses? Any flames licking at the hearts of our religious leaders, our rich man? John 5, 16 says, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. John eleven fifty three. 53, Then from that day forth they took counsel together to put him to death. Luke 4, 28, All they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. You see any figurative fire here? Any figurative torture? Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, He speaks blasphemy. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And the scriptures go on and on, painting the picture of the torment that the religious leaders were in. How hot were these flames of hatred that burned in the heart of our rich man, tormenting him without mercy, driving him even to murder over the fact that his day, his age, his world was ending and crashing down around him. Now the Old Testament is full of prophecies about emotional, spiritual, mental, figurative fire, as well, of course, full of the actual physical fire that was destined to come upon his people in the last day. Isaiah 5, 25, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. Fire. Isaiah 10, 16, Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. You know what that verse says? It's not fire, not nobody struck a match, but he's going to kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And this burning like the burning of the fire, of a fire were the flames that tormented our rich man, the Levitical priesthood, in this parable. In their hatred of Jesus as they sought to destroy him instead of being as they felt like destroyed by him. I would venture to say this is the afternoon or tonight that the word fire in the Bible is probably used figuratively as many times or more than it is of actual physical fire. For the last days, of course, there are many references to figure physical fire. And the anguish of spirit and mind of the Jewish people as their world ended. And of course, I'm talking about not that physical fire, but the fires of hatred, the passion that burned in the lives of our religious leaders as they realize they seem to be going down. And besides all this, verse 26, between us and you there's a great gulf fix so that they which pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. The great gulf, if this is a true story again and a natural gulf, it does not seem to be so great because Abraham and, and the rich man could talk back and forth across it. And again, it seems like from heaven that you could see the smoke across the chasm rising from the big fire. What was the great gulf that separated God from his people? Wow, that's an easy answer, isn't it? What was the great gulf that separated the priesthood from the God that instituted them and ordained them? You know that great gulf was their refusal to believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It was a gulf of unbelief. And it was so big that nothing but belief could bridge it. Jesus came into the world saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14 and 6. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And the religious leaders among the Jews, our Levitical priesthood, were determined that if the only way they could get to the Father was through Jesus, then they just wouldn't get to him. And so they refused to believe in Jesus. This holy priestly order would not believe in Jesus. And that great gulf of unbelief in Messiah stood between them and the peace and the joy and the salvation that Jesus offered to them. Jesus was the only way. He was the only bridge over that chasm between man and God was belief in Jesus Christ. They would not have him. So there was no relief for our rich man's suffering. There was no water 
for his tongue. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto them, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. We said earlier that the rich man calling his Abraham his father supported our position that the rich man had to at least be a part of the Hebrew family. And of course, Levi, head of the Levitical priesthood, is one of those 12 sons of Jacob. That fits. He was part of the Hebrew family. And now in verse 27, the rich man seems to have two fathers. He calls Abraham father, and then he says, talks about his father's house. Who or what was the rich man's father's house? Well, if the rich man was Levi, his father's house had to be the house of Jacob or Israel. This is shown to be correct by Abraham's answer. Abraham told the rich man his family had Moses and the prophets. Again, friends, who had Moses and the prophets? Not us, not me and you. It was the Hebrews, the Israelites, the Jews. They had Moses and the prophets. Can you see again that this whole discourse is about them and not about us? This story, this parable is about the people in the Hebrew family. They alone had Moses and the prophets. And the last two verses in the parable says, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will we be persuaded that one rose from the dead. I ask you tonight, friends, did one go to the Hebrew family having risen from the dead? And you know the obvious answer to that. Yes, the resurrected Jesus. And were they persuaded? Abraham said they won't be persuaded if one rose from the dead. And though one rose from the dead, the Hebrew family was not persuaded that Jesus was the Christ and they would believe in him. They still would not believe. They claimed to trust in Moses. But what did Jesus tell them in John 5 and 45? Do you think that I accuse you to the Father? There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed in Moses, ye would have believed in me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? They did not believe Jesus' words, and though he rose from the dead, they still refused to believe, even bribed the guards of the empty tomb in an effort to cover up and discredit the resurrection. And finally, now in closing, I said earlier when I said that Jesus uh, became our high priest and went back to his father to work in that job, I said that was a climax. But I've got a climax here at the end to me. Back in verse 28, when he was talking about his father, he said he had five brothers. But if the rich man was the Levitical priesthood, headed by Jacob's son, Levi, then Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and so he must have had 11 brothers. Right? The answer is that most of them were half-brothers. Folks, when Jesus says something, He's not just throwing words around. When he says something, there's some meaning to it. We can't always find what it is. But Levi had five whole brothers. And I'm going to read their names for you from Genesis 35 and 23. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, and Levi, Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. Wow. Wow. The rich man had five brothers. And there they are, right out of the account in Genesis. Have you ever seen them? They fit together so beautifully. There's this final point of the rich man having five brothers, and there their names are in the book. Does that just not tie, tie a big bow ribbon or a big rope around this whole story for you, this whole parable, and just wrap it up for you and help you to understand and see what it was all about. 
for me, it's just beautiful beyond describing. While my presentation has not been eloquent, while it has not been perfect, while it needs a lot of tweaking and polishing and perhaps even major changes, I've tried hard to present it as best I could. And of course, my best is never good enough. I confess to you to be open and opening that I'm just an old uneducated country preacher and not a very good one of them. Nevertheless, I hope that somehow God has done something with our words and that he's enabled you to get something worthwhile out of our little sermon. I hope you can see that the rich man and Lazarus is not a true story about a little rich man and beggar and a pack of dogs. That it was not a popular legend of the day and that it has nothing to do with you and me and what happens to us when we die. The rich man and Lazarus is a parable about the transition period, about the end of the old order of priests, the Levites, being replaced by the new order, the messianic priesthood of Yeshua, David. Applying totally to events in that first century and in that first century time frame. And in closing, it is worth noting that none, none of the apostles ever quoted any part of this story of the rich man and Lazarus in their exhortation to the Gentiles. None. This story was all about the Hebrew family. But if this text we've been dealing with, if this text of the rich man and Lazarus does indeed teach the future dreadful punishment of those who reject Christ, as the mainstream church says, then the great apostle to the Gentiles should have quoted it in every epistle he wrote. But nowhere in Paul's writings is a single reference made to the rich man and Lazarus. And for that matter, nowhere in Paul's writings did he ever talk about the doctrine of hell. Now, as we said earlier, some of us do believe in the doctrine of hell. And I hope you still love me. I still love you. But while the rich man and Lazarus has been the very rock of Gibraltar, the very main place to go to support the teaching of hell, after our little sermon today, I just don't see how we can feel good any longer about using this story to try to prove the church's teaching of eternal torture for sinners. While some of us do believe in hell, some of us do not believe in hell. But we've often been bothered. But what in the world then does the rich man and Lazarus story mean? I hope that our little story today has been of some help to you and that you've been able to grasp what it's all about and particularly that it has nothing to do with the eternal torture of sinful people. The rich man and Lazarus is a parable about the changing of the priesthood in the last days, as I see it and understand it today. And I leave this with you for your study and for your consideration. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. It's in your hands and the hands of these people. We pray, Father, that you would lead and guide us as we reminisce, as we study, and as we ponder these things. We beg, Father, that you would just help us to see and to understand and to know what you really want us to know. We tried as best we could, Lord, to deliver what you've given us. Now bless it, Lord, and let it become great fruit-bearing words in the hearts and the lives of these people. We beg in Jesus' name, amen.